you know, I'm a big fan of Levin. Levin's from Belgium, and he runs uh, Sec App Dev, another nonprofit developer education foundation out of Belgium, something I've been a part of. This is another nonprofit group, so I'm just a big Levin fan of the work he does trying to, uh, in a nonprofit way, teach developers about secure coding. There's not enough of that in the world, so talk to him about, again, Sec App Dev if you have a moment to before the day is over. My style of talk is to go fast and cover a lot of material. That's just the way I roll. So, and I'm going to and I'm going to deliver my slides to the to the foundation for you. A lot of speaker notes are in here as well. So the goal is for you to I'm going to blast through this talk fast and furious, give you the deck for continued study if you if you so care to. So hang on to your seats. Hold on. Let's talk about HTTPS. And wh how, what time do I have to speak until? May I ask to the dear proctors. 10.35. So I have 33 minutes to do like an hour and a half of material. Let's... <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim. I'm going to talk about security. I'm from the United States. So in Hollywood, we see people shooting at people, and the good guys never get shot. They never get blown up. But when crypto comes into play, everything freaking falls apart. Oh, no, they have crypto. I saw a padlock in the browser. Oh, no, we can't get to them. So this is... Let's get beyond that and talk about it for real, right? This is some random guy off the internet. I have no idea who this guy is. I just troll him over the internet. He trolls me about HTTPS. He said something really wise, which I want to get across here. Any unencrypted traffic visible to the adversary is not just an info leak. It's not just a confidentiality issue. It's a new attack vector for the attacker to inject attacks that he can use to exploit your system. So HTTPS is not just about confidentiality. It's about confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, authentication. And so what benefits do we get? Here we go. Confidentiality, the adversarial spy on your network can't see your data. We also get integrity. This is really important. The spy can't change your data. If you ever looked at a pineapple device, any HTTP connection going through a pineapple, you can inject whatever script HTML you want to the site with ease. So when I say integrity, I'm not kidding around. HTTP, the attacker on your network, in a trivial fashion, can modify everything. You also get authenticity. So when I go visit, your, especially in a one-way fashion, when you're deploying one-way TLS, your server is deploying HTTPS for anyone to connect to anonymously. You get authenticity, because when I visit your bank, I know it's the right bank. How does that system work? It's the certificate authority system. What do you all think of the certificate authority system as it stands today? And your answer should be something along the lines of bullshit or layers of bullshit, or stinky bullshit. What's one of, that's one of the many appropriate answers when analyzing the CA authority system, right? If you're part of the CA system, like a marketing manager for a CA, and you want to lecture me about your business and class, and just get out, please. You don't need to be here right now. This is not for you, and we'll talk about that later. So I've had, I've had CA managers troll me when I give this talk because we can only spend so much money on security. Yeah, whatever. Then don't be in the business, right? So when you do TLS, you get two major benefits. I'm sorry, when you're using TLS, you're using two basic primitive crypto algorithms, uh, crypto mechanisms. You have symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Why are these used together? You basically want some kind of, when you're using symmetric encryption, what's the big flaw of that? You can't exchange keys in public. So if, if two parties can't have a public communication and then revert to privacy with symmetric crypto, that's the whole purpose of like key exchange algorithms like Diffie-Hellman and so on is now you and I anonymous, you and I, in a public network can conduct a key exchange to, to build secure communications. That's the whole point of asymmetric crypto. But it's freaking slow. It's super slow. It's, not, it's so slow it would, it would break the internet if that's all we did. So we use asymmetric crypto to set up a, a, a strong connection between two parties in public and then drop down to symmetric crypto after we exchange key material, which is fast and furious and secure, but it's only a single key. So I like TLS and, and SSL for that matter in that it's a really graceful use of multiple primitives to conduct secure communications. Now, it's, it's got a bad history. Most of what we've done in SSL and TLS to date is broken. SSL 1, 2, and 3 are all gone. They're dead. So if you're using SSL 1, 2, and 3 in any way, Turn it off on all your clients, turn it off on all your servers. There's no benefit to using it anymore. We want to at least use TLS. TLS 1's a little iffy. We want to be using TLS 1.2 as much as possible, right? So let's get started. You want to get SSL. You want to get TLS correct in some way. The first thing you got to do is update your OS to the latest patch level. If you're still using Apache 1.3, what the freak are you doing? 
You have got to stop doing that. This is end of life in 2010. There's multiple zero days that are really inexpensive on the gray markets or black markets for that matter. Just up, focus on getting Apache up to 2224. This will update your open SSL library, fixing numerous problems right away. You would not be, believe how many folks are at this level right now. It is a big deal. So get away from anything below Apache 1.3. And as a quick note, uh, TLS, SSL, it is growing dramatically. So, you know, we're looking at the era where Snowden revealed some of the iffy things uh, governments of the world are doing. Yes, U.S., but there are a few other um, European authorities a part of that whole thing as well, right? So, and, we, and then now we're moving into the era of the I IOE, Internet of Everything, where the rise of use of TLS is, is rising dramatically. This is no longer an obscure thing. This is now a core part of how you deliver secure software. Now, again, the problem is that the attacks on TLS are in SSL pretty significant. We have a, we have a well-marketed, graphic-laden history of recent uh, issues with TLS that we have to address in some way. Luckily for us, it's usually patching. You know, it's usually an easy issue to fix this when the fixes are available. But TLS is, uh, is, is rising in use, but it's also rising in how researchers are analyzing it. So we have to be on top of this today, especially to be prepared for new things to happen. Now, let's look at the history of issues that we've seen in the authority system, first of all. That's one of my pet peeves. We'll talk about certificate pinning to detect when an authority goes bad. It's, I think it's a great place to start when talking about modern, well-done TLS. I'm going to start with DigiNotar, and the first sentence kind of says it. DigiNotar was a Dutch certificate authority, you know, owned by someone. It's all debatable who owned them, but attacker got into DigiNotar. Um, we had, uh, uh, they, they began issuing fraudulent certificates. Why is it a big deal when a CA ish can issue fraudulent certificates? What does that let the attacker do? More specifically, they can't, they can't like, you know, pick uh, uh, kale out of my backyard. Be specific. They can't do everything. They can conduct man in the middle. Why? Why does that work? Because when your browser gets a fake certificate to a web server that's signed by a real authority, even if it's a fake certificate, but it's signed by a real authority, what does your browser say? Your browser says, party time, no problem, we're in. That's the problem. That's one of the hearts of the problem. So let's go ahead to February 2012. We have US company TrustWave. They serve most of the US DOD and the government. They, they admitted that they took their private key, put it in an HSM, and went, for sale! If I, so back to you, what's your name? I'm going to pick on you. You're in. What's that? Ola. 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 Easy. So Ola. If I give you a piece of, uh, an, an HSM with the private certificate of a core CA that's live in the browser today, and I give it to you, what can you do with that? How easy is that going to be? Trivial. You can just issue any fraudulent certificate to any website, sign it with that HSM who has a private CA in it, a private CA certificate in it, and you can man mill anyone with these. And the browser says, party time. It's just, this is the part of the problem here. Now, Trustway came clean. They admitted their mistake, revoked their certificate, swore they would never do it again. And I don't, I don't care about that. What I care about is they said something very telling back in 2012. They said, Hey, guess what other CAs out there sell their private cert for profit? And guess what the real answer to that is to some degree? Which CAs would take their private cert and sell it for profit in some way if they can get away with it in the world today? My answer to that is pretty much all of them. This is the world we live in. So let's go ahead now to December of 2012. The Turkish government began issuing fake certificates to Gmail that were properly signed by the Turk Trust Authority. Why would Turkey issue fake certificates to Gmail to their populace that was signed by the real authority. What were they trying to do? It rhymes with the word fly. They were spying on their populace in some way. And, and Google at this time had begun implementing certificate pinning. They took a copy of Gmail's public cert and literally hard-coded it in the browser. So when you're making a TLS uh, key exchange request, you talk to the server. The server gives, back, uh, gives you back a, pro, a, pro, a public key of that server to start the conversation. And if that doesn't match what Google has hard-coded in the browser, you're being man in the middle and they'll inform the user in some way and send a message back to Google to inform Google which uh, authority had fraudulently signed this fake Gmail certificate. Turk Trust got caught doing this. They're a NATO ally. This news kind of went away. So they're, and they're the first one to get caught. Well, then Google, what did, did Google, what did Google do? They quietly tell Turk Trust not to do this? No, they blogged about it, right? 
This blog post was a warning to everyone saying, hey everybody, we are pinning all of Google's certs now. If you try to man the middle through fraudulent use of CA certificates, we're going to catch you and we're going to blog about it. This is a message to the world, intelligence agencies and people who are nation state man the middling or blue coat using these kind of techniques in public ways, whatever. This is the message to the world. We now go ahead to year December of 2013. You're not going to believe this. The French government, the, uh, the, uh, the French certificate authority, the uh, cybersecurity agency, began issuing fake certificates to Gmail that were, that were fake, not the, right, you know, not the right cert, and they were signed by France's cybersecurity agency. So work with me here. Why would the French government issue a whole bunch of fake certificates to Gmail, signed by their authority, fraudulent? What were they trying to do? Trying is the key word here. They were trying to... What, what were they trying to do? It rhymes with fly. They were trying to spy on their populace in some way. Now, they got caught because everybody who was analyzing this topic of SSL interception, we knew that Google was pinning. That was a really big deal in the world of SSL TLS interception. So what were the French cybersecurity agency doing all year? They were focusing on, wait for it, Fresh croissants, art, architecture, poetry, song, dance, loving life like the French do. What were they not doing their basic homework on science and mathematics? So now they got caught, and Google was like, French, you are out to the browser, fully revoked. The few days later, Google, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mozilla, Microsoft, and Opera all knocked them out of the browser as well. This is a huge deal. It's an entire government being knocked out of the browser, and all of a sudden, you know, thousands, if not more, sites around France stop, uh, stopped working in the browser in a clean way. So this is the world we live in. And what did what did the French government say? What happened behind the scenes? This was not on purpose. This was a configuration error. <laughs> what a crock of bullshit! All right, so. So now, so it's not just, it's not just uh, authorities that are making mistakes. Here we have registrars with easy CSRF to change DNS. So I, I, you target the admin of that domain CSRF against a registrar to change DNS. This game over in terms of security. Or how about OpenSSL and uh, the Heartbleed? This is a basic buffer overflow against uh, the Heartbeat API. The buffer overflow lets you steal data from the server anonymously. When Heartbleed was, was announced, it was, a, it was war on the floor for several days between many governments and hacking groups, right? And just in the last like 48 hours, we've heard about Logjam now. So this is some guy on the internet, I think he's smart, I don't know. He says, don't use export ciphers and generate a unique DH group. That seems like good advice. He's also saying, if you're running 124-bit DH, Diffie-Hellman, for key exchange, don't, uh, don't use a common group factor, common ones. You should be using 2048 if you can deal with it for compatibility issues. This is a legacy issue. This is export ciphers from 20 years ago, and they're biting us today. It's kind of crazy. But, so we have this coming up as well. So there are two issues, right? Please, please, Exactly, but, but the advice we give to developers, again, I've just gotten my hands on this in like a couple hours ago, right? So please, please bear with. The key thing is people are using old broken ciphers that were given during the, the US era of doing, export, uh, of doing export restrictions on cryptography. So we made export versions of all the main ciphers that were easy for the US government to, to crack in some way. And these are now hard coded in physical devices and old legacy systems are all over the place. And so basically, it's really easy to, if you're not using export ciphers and you build your own Diffie-Hellman group, it's, it's pretty easy to keep most of this at bay. There's also client-side issues in the browser, Chrome, everyone is working on it. There are other emerging issues being discussed. This just came out, just showing you a modern attacks against Logjam and that we have to be on top of this and be ready to react pretty quickly um, if, if we want to be on top of the most recent HTTPS threats. There's a lot of active research trying to crack these, these protocols. The basic mistakes of developers is you're sending anything over HTTP. My honest opinion about 2015 is when should we be using HTTP in 2014? Can anybody give me a good reason when we need to use HTTP? Anyone? Go ahead. Okay, so let me see if I got this right. You want me to connect my browser to your SSL like a load balancer over SSL and do plain text everywhere else inside. 
That is how almost every major breach happened. I was talking to Daniel Cuthbert earlier today. Daniel is a, uh, he's like a red teamer. He goes, he does combative security uh, for, for various organizations. And he said, I'm asking him, how realistic is it for you to break an organization and start sniffing traffic? He's like, let me explain something to you, Jim. Let me put this in language that you can understand. When we have broken into a network and start sniffing traffic for, as part of a test, as part of an engagement, we haven't even taken our pants off yet. We're just getting started. So breaking into a network and setting up some kind of sniffing capability, we haven't even begun to make love yet. We just haven't even taken off our pants yet. Are you with me now? That's how bad it is. So the idea of, this is one of the biggest flaws here. When you're like terminating SSL early in your infrastructure, that's one of the biggest misuses of, of, of this is one of the biggest uh, uh, misuses of a core security control. You should be doing HTTPS or some kind of strong transport security anytime you're sending sensitive data. And this is a big deal because most companies terminate at the boundary and do plain text everywhere. So as an attacker, I go buy a piece of malware that costs me $19.95 and you can get three versions of this for three domains for only $39.95. And that's all I need to sniff all of your traffic. It's easy. So. Um, let, let's charge on here though. Other failures we've seen is Apple had a two year bug, CVE 2014-1296. There's a huge deal because it let pretty much anyone man the middle against any iOS device or OS X device for two years except for uh, Chrome which has its own stack. Where's the bug? Let's do some code review. Where's the bug? Say it. Where? Not just there. Say it. Say it. I can't get too much higher, though. Just say it. What, what line of code is vulnerable? Oh, just a Do you any, see any code that's dead code in this, by any chance? Look at the second go to fail. Hey, I got a pointer. There we go. Look at the second go to fail here. This, you always bail out here and free the buffer and finish the connection. And this step, this final check to make sure that your cert's been signed properly is always skipped. This is dead code. I don't know about you, but my compilers picked this up 20 years ago. Dead code is an easy thing for a compiler to alert on, and yet this is in uh, Apple code. So one of two things happened here. Either it's a backdoor or it's complete negligence in their software, uh, software SDLC lifecycle for the most important piece of software that drives the heart of their company. So, you know, your mileage may vary. We also have issues with the, with the browser. The browser fails open. When things go wrong, we give, it, we give easy ways for users to keep on going in the face of insecurity. I, I think browsers have gotten better at this, but up until recently, 30 to 70% of people who see SSL TLS warnings, they just click through, and, that, and that's a big problem. Now, this is going to have a big effect on your businesses, is that Chrome is, getting, is turning into an activist. What, what I understand is that Google is very upset at what happened with the U.S. government, was going after them in a very adversarial way, and they've been pushing TLS really hard everywhere they can to keep this junk at bay. So Google in, in Canary just set HTTP connections as insecure. And all they're doing is, they're, it's in Canary, we're not sure when it's going live, they're going to set any HTTP website and put that little broken X there. That's all they're doing. And that's going to have major ripple effects in terms of customer service calls and, and marketing impressions of your website. And I, and I frankly, I think it's a good idea. I think this is the right move to make. Even Mozilla, these are some really crazy hippie activists, right? Even, even Mozilla's like, whoa, Chrome, you're making some strong moves here. They're not doing it yet, but considering it. So Google has got a lot of muscle, got a lot of weight in the room, and they're using it to try to make HTTPS better. Is that good or bad? Are they, are they being just and noble? I'm not saying that, but they are making it better. So, by the way, there's so many excuses I get in terms of why we shouldn't use TLS. One of them is certificates are too expensive or difficult to obtain. Well, there's a Let's Encrypt project coming out where everyone get free certs on, even on their subdomains. And if you're too cheap to buy a two to 300 euro certificate to protect your company, that puts you in the category of CB. You're a cheap bastard, right? So isn't TLS slow? Is SSL TLS slow? Guess what, folks? Not only is TLS not slow, TLS is faster and more performant than HTTP. I'm serious. Go look at is TLS fast yet using HTTP 1.1 and the speedy protocol, specialized compression and whatnot. Your HTTPS well configured server is faster and more performant than HTTP. Pitcher, go ahead. 
Come on, come on, come on, quick, 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 quick. I'm, I'm going to hurry. Go for it. You got it? You got it? Thank you. The other one is, oh, no, when you use strong HTTPS, that makes my security software that's monitoring all the people work in a much more, it's harder for me to work. It's like, whatever. If you're a site operator and you're really concerned about site load, there's CDNs that have HTTPS by default. I'm not going to mention any names. The biggest com the complaint I hear about HTTPS is the CDM vendor X doesn't support HTTPS well. I'm not going to mention their name. Some do and some have a big problem with it. Some do it well by default. And so there are plenty of other solutions. And the, the whole point of good HTTPS is to stop you from doing junk against my connection anyways. So let's improve it. I got 14 minutes to improve HTTPS. Let's see if we can pull this off. We want to talk about at least, we want to talk about strict transport security, certificate pinning, and forward secrecy ciphers. I think it's an interesting topic as well. Also, don't go configure your server by yourself. Mozilla has done a massive amount of work to build a server TLS configuration generator. You pick which browsers you want to support. You want to support old browsers like Fire, like uh, I'm just sorry, really old browsers like IE6. You want to support, you know, browsers from Firefox 1 and Chrome 1 and above, or do you want to only support modern up-to-date browsers? And they'll give you different configuration options based on what you're, what you're trying to pull off. This is brilliance from Mozilla. I give them a lot of credit for that work. There's also, I know how much you here in Europe just love and, and follow all the NIST guidelines. Yeah, NIST, we love those American cryptographic standards that have been backdoored by the NSA. Sorry about that. Uh, oops. Um, but this, 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 Pers th this document, incredibly well written and thought out. You should have a, you know, skepticism in anything you read, but this is a good thing to read if, you're, if you want to see uh, deeper practice suggestions about TLS and your infrastructure. And so the first big defensive thing I want you to care about is strict transport security. This is a browser standard. It's well supported by most browsers. When you make a request to a server over TLS, you can choose to respond by saying strict transport security for a certain number of seconds for all of my subdomains on this site. From that point on, any time the browser is told to make an HTTP connection to your domain, before that connection is made, it switches to HTTPS. So if like, some JavaScript attack redirected me to HTTP no longer works with this standard when this standard is in play. It won't work with self-signed certs, IP addresses, or plain tech connections. It works with any ports. When you use this, use a short duration and increase it once you know you haven't broken anything. If you have to revoke it, set the max age to zero. Um, the, the other key, yeah, here's what browsers support it today as well. Um, I mean, Chrome, Safari, Opera, Firefox have been supporting this for a while. Only IE is behind the times because they are? They're cheeky bastards. Thank you. Now, what's the problem with HSTS? HSTS is flawed in a lot of ways, but it's still important because how, does most, how do most new users interact with your website? They open up a browser, they type in the domain. When I just type in your domain, what does the browser default that connection to? So now you make an HTTP connection to my server, and I 302 redirect because my site, my site only supports HTTPS. Now your browser redirects to HTTPS. Now that we're doing HTTPS, I deliver strict transport security headers and bind the browser to use HTTPS from that point on for max age seconds. What is wrong with that scenario? You, hola, are you ready? So you're on the network. You're the adversary. You see the first hop. What can you do? You can do a 302 to your own HTTPS. What did you first say in the beginning? You can do what? You can do... Even before that, when I give you a hard time, you can do? Everything. Everything. <laughs> now you can say everything. All right. <laughs> you own that. You, you, are, you own it all. Exactly. And by the way, randomly calling things out in class, I highly encourage that. Keep it going. So this is brilliant. It's only a few thousand websites do this today. Less than 2,000 do it today. You can set your site to use HSTS, use HTTPS everywhere, have a high max age, and add the preload flag to your response header, then go to the Chrome project and basically check in your website, hard code it into Chrome, so the initial hits to your site already are configured for strict transport security. So when you do the preload list and you hard code your site into Chrome, Firefox, Safari, IE, they're all picking this up as well. They all agree on this, on this standard. Even the first hop trying to do HTTP will get switched to HTTPS. You need to do this to get HTTPS done securely. And this is, it doesn't scale well and it's, it's, it's still new and wonky, but you need to do the preload list if you want real HTTPS moving forward, there are a lot of other attacks to compromise it any time the browser can do HTTP. So the other big problem is the too much trust in authorities. We talked about that already. So you have a technique called certificate pinning. 
It's a key continuity scheme. You either hard code your cert in the client or, or you uh, trust the very first uh, request you make and the first cert you grab, and if it changes from that point on, you flag the user. There's tofu pinning, trust on first use, and there's what I call a priori pinning when you hard code the, the certificate. There's a great cheat sheet from De Jeffrey Walton from the OpenSSL project who discussed this with us. It's a way for you to detect when things go bad with an authority. When, and it's not just your authority going bad, it's any authority going bad. So they give you a fake cert, it doesn't match what you've pinned, and you, you inform the user they're being man the middle. And so in a mobile app, this is trivial. In a, uh, not trivial, it's easy, right? In a thick client, it's not so bad. In a browser, it's actually much more difficult. You have to use the experimental IETF pinning headers, and you can pin the hash of multiple certs and pin that in the browser for a certain amount of time. And you know, Levin is one who actually informed me about this a couple of years ago. And this is really, it is doable. But here are the, here's what goes wrong. Suppose you pin a cert two weeks before it's going to expire, and you pin it for three months. What did you just do, Levin? Pardon me? Be specific, Levin. When I, have a, when I have a pin time of three months and the, the cert's about to expire in two weeks, what did I just do to all those users? Yeah, you just denial of service those users. You stop them from being able to use your site. So here's your strategies. Always have a backup pin from a different CA as part of your pinning strategy. When your cert is about to expire, like two weeks before it expires, it's too late. About a year before it expires, get a new cert and pin it. So when expiration time comes, you can drop it out of your pin header without any kind of uh, a continuity problem. Dr. Veta, what's up? Good to see you. Give, give me a hug, give me a hug. Come on, give me a hug. Come on, Dr. Wetter. Come up, come up here for a second. Good to see you. Good to see you. What's your question? I haven't seen you in so long. Dr. Wetter. Dr. Wetter. Gentlemen, excuse us. It's the man love. Dr. Wetter. It's good to see you, buddy. Hey, thank you. It's good. What's your question? Go, go, go. What's that? Oh, it's actually a request for comments now. It's no longer an experimental. This is now a formal W3C standard request for, in the request for comments phase. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> right, right like that? Well, I have, well I'm, I'm sure we have multiple pins here. SHA-1, SHA-1, and SHA-256. Yeah, awesome. Let's change this, right? <laughs> We're having a moment. We've got we to gotta keep these things fixed. I'm going to deliver this to you. Dr. Wetter, awesome. I'll, I'll update this even more before, before the conference is over. Thank you. So you have these, you have these headers available. Again, you're going to get caught with expiration issues. So make sure that you're, uh, you have a, a spare cert from a different CA ready to hot swap in. Make sure that you have uh, that a year before things expire, you begin to pin that as well. So when expiration boundaries are passed, you're already ready for it. Question? That's out of my area of immediate understanding, so I, I'm just not that deep into that particular thing. So I, I, maybe he's smart. I, I hope you're smart. Listen to him, right? <laughs> and I have a section here from the co-author of this on stapling and that, those kind of issues. So I'll, I'll at least leave him in the deck. I'm going to skip over it to make up time. I got six minutes. Let's go. Um, we did that already. We talked about this already. This is what Chrome does when it sees that your pinning has been violated in some way. It also sends a note to Google so they know which CA did this as well. So, or you can actually configure the, UR, the, the reporting URL to tell yourself what happened, which CA did a fake cert, or what went down, um, so you can uh, react to that event in some way as part of the standard, just like Content Security Policy Reporting API. I think this is a good job. Your connection is not private. Attackers might be trying to steal your information from Google with your passwords, messages, or credit cards. This is really a clear message. If they hit reload, that's, there's no hope for them. So the only, the only thing that really bothers me, when I, when I learned about this, this really upset me. This is that when you install a local authority into any browser, the pinning APIs are all skipped. Look at what happened with Lovino. Lovino, and I don't want to blame 
Lovino. Lovino allowed one of their advertising vendors to install like adware type software on their machine. You know, you know, Dell and HP, they've all done this to some degree. I don't want to shame Lovino, but, th but what they allowed this uh, advertiser to do is literally install a local authority in the user's browser in Lovino machines before they sent it to the customers who bought it. And, and, and Robert Graham was able to extract the key from this package, which lets him man the middle easily any Lovino user. The point that what got me here was, is that any Google made the choice to not accept local attackers in their threat model for Chrome. And, I, and I'm like, but wait a second, anyone gets a local authority in a browser, that means that a company can man build their employees to monitor their software without telling them. That means that uh, you know, any kind of software that gets installed lets, lets, lets the pinning API be evaded. I want to know when, I'm being, when my pinning is being evaded, even through a local authority, and Google decides to squash that. And their excuse was, it's not part of our threat model. We can never stop a local attacker. But they consciously wrote code in their browser to specify that a local authority completely evades pinning. This is to allow security software to be installed on people's machines and t monitor all their TLS connections without any kind of interruption, without any kind of notification to the user. I think this is a big deal. This is really an upsetting thing that's happening, and I think we should change this, but it's not an easy issue, right? I have a section here on revocation with extensive notes. This is from Cassio Goldsmith, who wrote this section. So if you're interested in proper revocation life cycle, it doesn't violate privacy, that's not using a a, a revocation list which doesn't scale. This is a really good series of slides. The notes are in here in detail. When I release the slides, go for it. I'm not going to talk about it. Last note before we finish up, stop using old ciphers. We just saw this in Logjam. Like, anybody here using, ex no, using export ciphers in their website consciously? Absolutely not. This is a 20-year-old issue. So um, when you're using an old cipher, there's a bigger problem, though. If you're using old cipher, uh, RSA for key exchange, the problem there is that as an attacker, I, if I'm a passive attacker recording traffic all day long, it might be hard for me to break that crypto. So I'll just, as a, as a threat agent, I'll just record that traffic for a long time and eventually try to break the private key, steal the private key in some way. If you're using, if you're using an old cipher that a passive attacker who records traffic and somehow gets to your private key can decrypt all traffic that server ever encrypted. And that's, that's how nation states like to go after people to some degree. Enter perfect forward secrecy ciphers. These are things like elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, which is not vulnerable to logjam type of stuff, by the way. Th these are things like key exchange algorithms that, that create temporary symmetric keys that are not derived from your private keys in any way. That if an attacker cracks that key, they get a small part of the message and have to re-crack again to get another key. So this is to stop, again, passive attacks who, are, who pop your key from decrypting previously recorded traffic. Now, as someone from uh, Schubert Phyllis told me, one of the, the Frank from Schubert Phyllis told me, he's like, the private key still needs to be protected. Because if I could steal your private key, I might not be able to derive all your previously recorded traffic or decrypt that, but I can at least man the middle you if I have a copy of your private key. So we still must protect the private key, preferably in an HSM or, or, or something strong. Here's an example of, of, uh, of uh, Here's an example of different uh, uh, configuration ciphers within TLS that provide the forward secrecy. It's usually elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman or similar. We're no longer using plain um, um, RSA for key exchange. The era of RSA is pretty much over. It's time to pr pretty much stop using it everywhere. And again, we have the key exchange algorithm, we have authentication algorithm, we have the authentication algorithm, we have uh, different modes and lengths, and I'm, I'm short on time, but in short, we should prefer elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman for key exchange and authentication. We should be using AES today still. There's nothing better out there that I know of. We use SHA-256 or better for macking, et cetera. So I think this is pretty well known at this point. The time to retire RSA is now. Google, Google is going to start uh, strongly adding graphics when you're using R RSA in your, in, your, uh, in your key chain very soon. They have a, pat they have a, a, a plan to do this. We're done. Call to action, use strict transport security. Make st step one, do HTTPS or strong transport security everywhere. Set up strict transport security and make sure you're doing the preload initiative in the browsers as well. Pin the certs everywhere you can to detect when, in the, when you're given a fake certificate to man the middle of you and make sure you're using forward secrecy ciphers for everything you're doing to stop passive attackers. There's another section on, on, on OSCP. This is a, a revocation lifecycle that's in the deck. Please read it.
and move away from RC4 and RSA. This is the basic plan for TLS and HTTPS. So much has been improved. The work has been done by Google, browser vendors, cryptographers, this huge amount of work to get us where we are today. Guess what? Now it's your turn. Let's get HTTPS right. It's a basic foundation to secure software. Thank you very much. We're done. Have a great day, everyone. One question, any questions, go for it. Questions, questions. Hola, give me a question, please. No, you're not going to. All right, go ahead, please. Breaking into your network and installing a simple piece of malware in your network gear is usually a trivial task for a dedicated attacker. That's the issue. It's not going to affect outside looking at, looking at your site, but you've you got to go back to 1972, the original white papers on information security, Salter and Schroeder from MIT, and they said as a main tenant to all of information security, you never trust the infrastructure that you're on. We're in the era, HTTPS everywhere, or one piece of malware, 1995, is going to undermine all plain text data going throughout your company. We should have our internal networks everywhere over HTTPS. And I'm an academic. It is easy for me to say that. You have to do the actual hard work. Bye-bye. <laughs> so. <laughs> Any more questions? We're good? Have a great day. Thank you so much. Cheers. Enough applause. Enough applause.